Hello everyone, welcome to Cashcroft TV. My name is Kalen Ashcroft. Thank you very much for watching and or listening to this video on Guide to Legal History and Historians, where we will be going through the entirety and all the chapters and authors of the Oxford Handbook of Legal History, edited by Marcus D. Dubber and Christopher Tomlins, which is a, um, I think, a, probably the best overview of legal history that I have been able to find. However, it must be noted it is not a chronological history, but rather a, a, a compilation of chapters or a compilation of the works of many great legal historians of today. But however, there will be some chronological elements in it as well, but they will be kind of divided ap across this chapter. So that being said, please do not feel any obligation to watch these in order. However, it must be noted that this is episode 15, so we're going to cross through the halfway point of the series, which I think, in my opinion, is the most, always for me in any kind of endeavor, getting to the halfway point is the most important milestone, I find. I think, obviously, getting to 10% is great to get your feet off the ground, but getting to 50% really is an achievement in that it feels like the that it's the work has a capacity to be completed, which I hope and I endeavor to do. So nonetheless, these this is episode 15. We're in part three, Perspectives, Legal, his, legal History in Modern Legal Thought. We will be covering chapter 29, Structuralist and Post-Structuralist Legal History by Justin Desotel Stein. And s chapter 30 of this, in the same section says who? Critical Legal History Without a Privileged Position by John Henry Schlegel. And in the style of Plutarch, who is probably one of the most influential authors in my life, I will do biographies of each of the two respective authors of the two chapters. And at the end, we'll also have a comparison at the end, just to learn a little bit more about the two individuals through contrast. And... Yeah, without further ado, we shall begin with the biography and chapter of J Justin Desotel Stein. So, in terms of his biography, he is currently at the Colorado University of Colorado Boulder School of Law. He is the director for the Center for Critical Thought, and he's also the founding director of that organization, too. He's an associate professor of law, the Colorado Boulder, University of Colorado Boulder call Law School, and he's also an affiliated faculty in the Department of History as well at the University of California, Colorado Boulder as well. He's been on the law faculty since 2009, and he's widely recognized as a leading voice in critical legal theory and historiography. He, his courses that he teach include international law, law and economic development, conflict of laws, globalization, critical race theory, jurisprudence, and property. He, he concentrates on the history of legal thought with a special emphasis on U.S. and international relations. His two most recent books include, both published from the Cambridge University Press, The Jurisprudence of Style, A Structuralist History, American Pragmatism and Liberal Legal Thought, published in 2018 by the Cambridge University Press, and also as a co-editor with Christopher Tomlin's Searching for Contemporary Legal Thought, published also by the Cambridge University Press in 2017. He also has a forthcoming book titled Racial Ideology and the Global Legal Order, which will, is expected to be published by the Oxford University Press, so look up, out for that, as I will myself. Prior to joining the University of Colorado, he practiced for years in antitrust and competition group at Lotham and Watkins in Washington, D.C., where he served on the codification division, or he also served on the codification division of the United Nations Office of Legal Affairs, and as well as a consultant Afghanistan Constitutional Commission, so significant practice as a lawyer, as well, in addition to his academic work. He holds graduate degrees from Harvard Law School, the Fletcher School at Tufts University, and the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. During his graduate studies, he received fellowships with the South African Development Organization and taught a course in U.S. Civil Rights Movement in Shenzhou College in China. So he also has significant international experience as well. So very exciting intellectual. 
So moving into his chapter, it is once again chapter 29 in part three, Perspectives, Legal History in Modern Legal Thought, the Oxford Handbook of Legal History, and it is titled Structuralist and Post-Structuralist Legal History. So he says this short, he opens up saying this is a short depiction of the historical method in the registrars of structuralist and post-structuralist theory begins with postmodernism. So, so we'll see there are kind of two branches or two applications of postmodernism. And I think, I hope at least for you, this chapter was very uh, revealing for me. So I learned more about postmodernism, structuralism, and post-structuralism. So very exciting for me, particularly. And so he says, what was or is postmodernism remains forever contested. Nonetheless, it will provide us with an orientation and landmarks to which we can build upon what is post-structuralism and structuralism. He says with this definition, if postmodernism is a family of suggestions for historic, historicizing the world, post-structuralism and structuralism are two posture, historical postures or ways of practicing the postmodern. So, the labels, he says, are a bit amiss, however, because structural, structuralist legal history really could be considered post-post-structuralist history, and therefore he will begin with a discussion of post-structuralist uh, post before going into structuralism, so don't, um, uh, that's just a clarification to make, so in his definitions, structuralism comes after post-structuralism through, um, or in perhaps the best way of thinking of it as well. However, they both derive from or are applications of postmodernism. They're also, they're by deriving the postmodern suggestive gestures from the post-structuralist posture of legal history, and they will move to a conclusion with a summary of the structuralist rival. So they could be seen as rivals because perhaps there are and there are post-structuralists who are opposed to structuralists. However, for also through the course of this chapter, we will discuss firstly postmodernism, secondly post-structuralism, and thirdly structuralism. And hopefully the all three definitions will make sense and be um, fascinating for you as much as they were and are for me. So starting with section one titled postmodern suggestions. So the first signs of the encounters with postmodern was the presence of the heavy skepticism about the availability of apodictic stories ma marching through time. They were anxious about ground, grand master or meta narratives and the historical explanations to and periodizations over space and time. So that is um, one of the defining features of postmodern is that they're skeptical of these grand narratives that are constant throughout time or times. A similarly distinct suggestion of the postmodernists are uh, that they worry about a totality or and therefore wage a war on totality. Frederick Jameson, starting with um, Frederick Nietzsche's Knights of Totality, uh, argues against integrated, unified, and universal truths beyond immediate experience. So Nietzsche also can be considered one of the earlier con conceivers of the postmodern because he was worried about these knights of totality who believed in these, um, not necessarily grand narratives, it's different in that, but uh, totality is that it excludes the intimate exper experience. Therefore, postmodernists first took the knights as, as um, Marxists, but they, so the po postmodernists believed these knights were Marxists. However, the liberal totalities could be just as vulnerable too, so there are liberal totalities as well. So postmodernists, while often can seem considered on the left or considered liberal, they are also opposed to liberals as well, and Marxists as well as they were originally conceived. So unlike some other areas, the postmodernists weren't necessarily um, built in response to the right, but they were perhaps built in response to the Marxists. But also they also have issues with some uh, ideas behind liberalism as well. And therefore they actually advocate for more of a schizophrenic rather than a fixed order of the personal. So that's the totality element, the second defining feature, the first being that of skepticism about grand narratives. 
and the third suggestion of postmodernism underscores hostility to philosophical realism flowing over Descartes, Bacon, Locke, Hume, Kant, and the analytic tradition. So they, they're, they had a problem with the empirical and or materializing claims about the world and instead believed it was more heterogeneous or plural. And these are the three postmodern suggestions. So this last one is they kind of opposed many of these analytic or empirical thinkers, those being, once again, Descartes, Bacon, Locke, Hume, and Kant, and advocated for more plural world views. But I think perhaps in their defense or perhaps in the contrast to postmoderns, don't have to go on too much of a tangent, but perhaps it might be wrong to uh, prescribe by everything Bacon says, but by reading Bacon, Descartes, Locke, you might be able to get a perhaps a, a might postmodern or rather a plural perspective. But nonetheless, the postmoderns are skeptical of them individually as in, in conjunction with the two previous things, which are that being um, the meta world views and also totalities of experience. He says that the latter two suggestions are more positive and give postmodern historians something to plan for. Um, that the, these new suggestions, that being post-structuralist and structuralism. So postmodern is this very much a negative thing and there aren't too much, there isn't necessarily built in too much to build from it, but post-structuralism and structuralism give more opportunities. In the first place, post-structuralist historians, historicism is an opportunity, and in the second, structuralist legal history. That is different definitions, so that is once again post-structuralist historicism and structuralist legal history. The latter requires one pass through the first to yield, however, an elaboration of structural insights minus the dogma. So it seems as not to uh, put words in his mouth, but it does seem like Justin de Sotel and Stein is a little more favorable to structuralism over post-structuralism, but, um, but as we'll see, he has very great reasons for it. And yes. Moving to the first of the two, being post-structuralism, which, once again, don't confuse it, post does, post means after, but post-structuralism, he um, advocates is a more uh, uh, earlier conception than structuralism. And this, this is section two, titled Post-Structuralist Genealogy. So between po the postmodern gate and the two passageways stands Michael Foucault, both, both archaeologists, both both the archaeologies are derived from uh, Michael Foucault. However, the latter uh, specifically uses the term archaeologies. But, but, but regardless, the point here is that postmodernism connects with these two suggestions, that being post-structuralism and structuralism, through, in, uh, to a certain degree, Michael Foucault. In Nietzsche, his genealogy, his history greets a gaze to the post-structuralist passage. So Nietzsche's genealogy also um, uh, greets a gaze to this post-structuralist passage. So the hostility to grand narratives, historical totalities, and positivist devotion to the objective reality all display the 1777 traditional device for the constitutional comprehensive view of history and the teaching. The path must be dismantled, according to Michael Colt. And genealogy is gray, meticulous, and patiently documentary, also by Foucault, Foucault, and episodes in a series of subject objections, subject, pardon me, subjugations. Um, and therefore, it is a, um, built through a time of discontinuity. And there are every beginnings, multiple beginnings, and they have to be attentive to petty malice. Furthermore, Foucault was influenced by Peter Goodrich's Oedipus Lux, and that retrospection is a kind of sorcery that invents, imagines, and reinvents, and tears apart one past against another. So Foucault is alluding to this post-structuralist ideology through references to Nietzsche, through references to Peter Goodrich, in that they're, um, by historicizing, or as we mentioned before, post-structuralist historicism, is defining a certain history, but it overlaps with or, or replaces another. And he also advocates that there are multiple beginnings to histories. And um, also, I think through extrapolation, one can say different sizes one can cut history. Like Foucault, 
is that there is no cure for the chimera of origin. That is something also that uh, Peter Goodrick advocated. So there is deeply, this is deeply a postmodern posture in that post-structuralism genealogy suggests history of law is endlessly differentiated and the boundaries with economics, culture, and politics are ultimately indiscernible. Pierre Schulag remarked recalling Latour, the legal world is a world of hybrids, not conceptually inter intertwined only, but ontologically as well. So this is all defining post-structuralism. Post-structuralism, however, mellowed with the lowering opposition to functionalist historicism, and it's and it sought to understand which sought to understand legal change in response to basic conditions of material life by identifying essential needs of society. The assault on functionalism peaked in the 1980s, therefore strengthening post-structuralism. However, the um, where they were accused of by the register of legal genealogy of mistaking society's real needs and interests for unavoidably particularized local presence about the needs and interests. So that is the uh, functionalist, which I think the root of the word is function. So these laws are perhaps created for certain functions, whereas the post-structuralists advocated that there are um, uh, many other reasons that these might have happened both through uh, function, but also through perhaps um, the the powerful cult, the cultural or economic facts factors, which could be seen as uh, Marxist as well, but basically advocating a plurality. And in in all intents and purposes, my understanding of post structuralist is it really just uh, uh, flattens the lane uh, playing field more so, as we will see, as opposed to structuralism. Therefore, law and society perspective of the functionalist historicism was expanded perhaps by the post-structuralist to be law and almost anything. Um, by the post-structuralist as law and everything. And there it challenges that formula, uh, 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 that, uh, 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 pr that reason for creating that. And therefore it's contended that the po uh, that historians political for example for Colts political or economic functions was law fulfilled was too hazy and therefore there was a but the rebellion largely mellowed out and therefore post structuralism as a, as um, also died or decreased in popularity at this time however it peaked perhaps in the 1980s with the, by through opposition to functionalism so moving to section three, which is what is structuralism then, now that we've seen this sort of gap that post-structuralism, which was a response to functionalism, had slowly died out because it was perhaps too broad, I would think it would be the primary reason, but also because it lost its primary opponent. Therefore, he says, as functionalist historicism continued to develop in the general atmosphere of post-structuralist genealogy, the future of legal history looked certain an intensely plural and very complex conversation. Goodrich and Schlag referred to themselves as post-structuralists as well. Um, Goodrich was previously referenced, but Schlag was not. As the next century rolled in, it brought uh, these underco this uh, undercover albatross, however, that legal structuralism seemed out of step with postmodernism altogether, and the with the apparent inclination for totalizing and universally transcendent explanations for autonomous law. So therefore, if there had to be some sort of autonomous law in uh, because it was law and everything, which would be a non-postmodernist belief. And therefore, not specific contexts like lumber and sex industries he references, but instead obsessed with doctrine. And they were smacked with law office history um, or law office history is like uh, he says is not actual history because it's just focusing on law history which is he says not true history not re not really history at all and it sickened out all three postmodernist concerns so post-structuralism had a um, had a serious issues with postmodernism in that it's starting to create a totality and the irony that 
it was an irony that not out of step with postmodern sensibility as legal genealogy, however, the author argues it was even more receptive, um, that being a structuralism. So also, first moving to structuralism now, so we say, he says structuralism that also had the cult as its greeter, but less yeah, in, a, in the less fashionably known archaeology he's known for, but less known for with his connection to uh, previously mentioned to post-structuralism. And this allows us to perhaps divest of the totality of post-structuralism. For example, he references the concept of political economy using the archaeological perspective of Foucault in that the, the, it's a tree of derivative discourse, um, not dispel political economy, but isolate specific locus somewhat arbitrarily, perhaps archaeologically. So unlike post-structuralists where they would say there is or it's impossible to define political economy without defining sociology, without defining all these things, the structuralists advocate that political economy does exist through an archaeological process through defining the, the, the derivative elements. And therefore, it's um, discursive formation defined if it can establish the groups and not construct inside out, but enable them to appear according to Foucault. And therefore, they, ex these, they exist under the positive conditions of a complex group of relations. That's a quote from Foucault. And Foucault's archaeology is less influential in the initial 1970s and 1980s of structuralist works such as Roberto Unger, Duncan Kennedy, Gerald Frug, and David Kennedy. And the, but the author still finds it more useful platform to launch structuralist legal history. So here's a caveat here. Although this Foucault legal archaeology was not popularly, especially at the inception, linked with structuralism, he says this Foucault's archaeology is a best way of understanding structuralism. Robert Gordon said post-structuralist legal history is difficult to show the alternatives. In contrast, structuralist preferred context is a is a legal context as well. So that that this we run into another issue as well that structuralists are focused on the dogma of legal history, and uh, we will soon reconcile this. But the, so this does not equal, it, but is not doctrinal history itself or traditional philosophy of history. Instead, rather structuralists focus solely on the content of the rules and look at the structure and ways in which the jurors put rules into documents and legal arguments. So they're not looking just reading the documents themselves, but they're looking at the context of it as well. Whereas post-structuralists would advocate for the legal texts or doctrine to be just as valuable as any economic text. The structuralists put more emphasis on the legal text, but unlike doctrinalists, uh, they uh, take a more comprehensive view of the text. So while structural history of legal thought focuses on grammatical structure, lexicological um, terrain and style about legal concepts, it is not an end but the beginning of the study. It's not reasonable that every legal field presents lexicon in the same way as well, so it doesn't become too doctrinal as well because the way one reads contracts is different from the way one reads torts etc. And therefore it's an open-ended list of contra contrasting technical rules. For example, Foucault's political economy may begin with property and contract text as well. So it's once again very plural and going back to the postmodern uh, uh, deviations, or, uh, de derivations, pardon me. And therefore they look for co coherence and predictability in the swamp to avoid nihilism and laws and policies, it is argued, that, so that's um, perhaps one of the reasons why structuralism is used, but the master jurist presents a style. So inevitably the master jurist presents a style and is not a simpleton on autopilot, so there, therefore there's a necessity of looking at the context in which the jurists work, but also an importance of being a master juror in recognizing one's own context. And therefore, it's important to interrogate jurists' backgrounds, too, to blend in uh, the blend of semiotics and uh, phenomenology. And it's not out of step with the postmodernism, once again, by looking at all these elements, by looking at the legal context narrative is separate, 
positive form of the negative orientations. So while the postmodernist is uh, quite completely negative, the post-structuralist is largely negative as well. This structuralism has a place to start, it seems. It does share the negative uh, reorientation, the negative assertions of time, in that things obviously do change in time, so all three are bound by time. But the risk of the structuralism is that it learns from genealogy the terror of confusing the deep structure of higher order proposals with essential manifestations of the true. And therefore they must face the terror firsthand by realizing everything changes. Therefore, structuralist insights without dogma is, um, is a, perhaps a would-be post-structuralism. Uh, but post-structuralism uh, structuralism does incorporate this dogma, but applies a postmodern view of this doctrine. And it's focused on the indeterminable now, whereas structuralism focuses on the fluids. So the post-structuralism is focused on the indeterminable now, whereas structuralism, according to the author, is focus on a fluid stream of content, constant becoming. Therefore, to fail to understand how structure transforms is failed postmodernism criteria of the temporal contingency. And he says, to some, both post-structuralism and structuralism for, are from postmodern suggestions, but post-structuralism understands a view of time in a hybridized, legalized world of pistache and presence, whereas structuralism constructs historical totalities and narratives in the middle of a genealogical uh, adventure or uh, carnage or pardon me a genealogical carnage and sometimes the structural transformation can be very slow and he asks how do we speed up the change of uh, structural transformation and therefore you look for and understand the grammars and styles of legal thought what have been and may become and therefore it's a recursive element as well and he says, for if we cannot see what the structure of practice might come to be, if these imaginative possibilities remain mystified, structural transformations remain more difficult, and our present circumstances even more frozen. So from here, I, sort of, I somewhat de derive that he's most favorable to structuralism, and based on his arguments, as am I, I think it has the most positive approach or most uh, ways to go, whereas postmodernism by itself is entirely negative. Post-structuralism is focused always on the now, but constantly upgrading the now. For example, the many beginnings, or and, uh, and it's co almost constantly reinterpreting history, whereas structuralism is a constant state of becoming. So I hope these are, in my opinion, three very challenging concepts, but that's being postmodernism, post-structuralism, and structuralism. So I hope you managed to follow along as I did, and I know I learned a lot thanks to Justin Dezotel Stein in these three areas and through his wonderful chapter. So we will discuss him more in the comparison, but first to move to the content of his slide. So the institution that he's at is the University of Colorado Boulder Law School. His positions are director, founding director, the Center for Critical Thought, an associate professor of law, and affiliated faculty in the Department of History. His current teachings include international law, law and economic development, in, in, and international relations. His scholarship concentration is the history of legal thought with an emphasis on United States and international relations. His suggested readings include The Jurisprudence of Style, A Structuralist History of American Pragmatism and Liberal Legal Thought, published by the Cambridge University Press in 2018, and Searching for Contemporary Legal Thought, published by the Cambridge University Press in 2017, co-edited with Christopher Tomlins, one of the editors also of the Oxford Handbook of Legal History. And once again, he also has a forthcoming book titled Racial Ideology and the Global Legal Order to be published by the Oxford University Press. So stay tuned. Once it, um, and moving to the logos, we have the universe. These are um, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, where he received a graduate degree, the Fletcher School at Tufts University, where he also received a graduate degree and Harvard Law School, where he also received a graduate degree, and Colorado Law, Berk uh, Colorado Law Boulder Law School, um, University of Colorado Boulder Law School, where he is currently a professor. In terms of the quotes, we have firstly, the argument is this, if we imagine postmodernism as a family of suggestions for historicizing the legal world, 
we can also imagine post-structuralism and structuralism as two historical postures, two ways of practicing the postmodern. Next quote, it is in this sense that the labels are misleading since I take the structuralist legal history to really be a kind of post-post-structuralism. That's the order of the chapter. And next quote, these three postmodern suggestions, concerns about meta-explanations, totalities, and objectivism or realism are all, in a sense, bottomed out on a view of time. Next quote, for if we cannot see what the structure of practice might come to be, if these imaginative possibilities remain mystified, structural transformation remains ever more difficult and our present circumstances ever more frozen. So his essentially solution, as I read it, is would be the uh, the way to change the structure is to study structuralism and perhaps stru post-structuralism and postmodernism in effect. So once again, his chapter is ch chapter 29, Structuralist and Post-Structuralist Legal History in the Oxford Handbook of Legal History in Part 3, Perspectives, Legal History in Modern Legal Thought. We'll discuss Justin de Sotel Steins shortly after our chapter and biography of John Henry Schlegel. So, starting with his biography, um, short biography, he's a, at the University of Buffalo in New York State School of Law, where he's a distinguished professor, as well as the Floyd H. and Hilda L. Hurst faculty scholar. He joined the faculty in 1973. From 1968 to 1973, he was an attorney at the Appellate and Test Case Division the Legal Aid Bureau of Chicago. From 1987 to, uh, to 19, uh, pardon me, 1967 to 1968, he was a teaching fellow at Stanford University Law School, and he received his Bachelor of Arts from Northwestern University in 1964 in Illinois, as well as his Juris Doctor from the University of Chicago Law School in 1967. He was born on January 12, 1942 in Terre Haute, Indiana. He teaches corporate, commercial, area, and port, um, and is part of the faculty group that offers the financial transactions concentration, teaching both acquisition transactions and the concentrations program in finance in New York City. He also teaches a two-semester seminar on economic development. His research focus is on American legal realism, legal history of the American economy, corporate finance, economic redevelopment of the Rust Belt cities. His books include While Waiting for Rain, Community, Economy, and Law in the Time of Chaos, published by the University of Michigan Press in 2022, as well as The American Legal Realism and Empirical Social Sciences, published by the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill Press in 1995. Another article that he recently wrote is saying thanks for some self-reflection, published by the Buffalo Law Review in 2021, as well as if the music hadn't stopped or reflections on the great kerfuffle, historicizing, historicism's continuing grasp for truth, published by the Yale Journal of Law and Humanities in 2021. So much significant work and practice under this great scholar, John Henry Schlegel. So his chapter is titled chapter 30 says who that is if you're only listening to that s-e-z it's spelt um says who critical legal history without a privileged position so um, that says who is a non-privileged position as we'll see but and it is um and also in section three or part three perspectives legal history in modern legal thought once again Chapter 30 says, Who Critical Legal History Without a Privileged Position by John Henry Schlegel. So this is, his section is not divided up into multiple sections, so I'll try to um, pace out the text as best as possible, but um, uh, uh, bear with me. So he says, opens up with a thanks to Michael, Barry, Dan, Laura, and Fred for their help and friends, as well as his friends at University of Virginia Law School's Legal History Colloquium, for the reading and commenting on an earlier draft. He says, no more than they can we suppress the universal wish, oh, sorry, pardon me. He opens up with a quote or a little passage from a um, from W.H. Auden saying, no more than they can we suppress the universal wish to guess or slip out of our own position into an unconscious condition. So a nice little poem by W.H. Auden. 
and uh, we'll reference it again later. So he says, opens up with back around the turn of the century when Christopher Tomlins, once again referenced one of the editors of the Oxford Handbook of Legal History, was working on his British work on British colonization of North America, uh, where he had a critique, the talk of helping the natives with Christianity and civility, where in fact, Christopher Tomlins shows that it was rather for different reasons than for helping the natives. Um, the author here, John Henry Schlegel, asked Christopher Tomlins, can you name a conquering civilization that lamented its colonization and destruction of a more advanced, more noble civilization? To which Christopher Tomlins replied, no. So John Henry Schlegel followed up with the next question. If so ordinary, why is it so hard? Why are we so hard on the colonizers if it is so common? And then Christopher Tomlins replied, if I had to accept the ordinariness of this attitude, I cannot make my argument with an exclamation mark. So he says that Christopher Tomlins rightfully ignored uh, the, uh, the critique um, that uh, the American experience was um, for freedom, um, but rather instead he advocated that it was mostly through violence that their ends were achieved. But the exchange, however, still haunted John Henry Schlegel since. However, it seems as though he's now reconciled after writing this chapter. So he said this pointed out a problem at the time only inchoately perceived in the work of his friends in the critical legal studies that at the time he only un, you know, un, marginally understood in that they would treat critiques as complete when finished. This is critical legal studies, a very important area to uh, note. So I, I appreciate John Henry Schlegel uh, like writing this chapter. So he notes that uh, Tomlins uh, was a partisan of the critique in that, but in no sense a traveler or follower of critical legal studies. But he says, how is it not possible critical legal studies was to hide the debatable foundations, which is the purpose of this chapter. So uh, he does not, uh, he thinks Christopher Tomlin's conclusions in his book, I believe he's referring to Freedom Bound, was that his conclusions were correct. However, many critical legal studies um, um, scholars, they uh, once they have produced their work, they consider complete and they don't really move on from it. So he sees this as an issue perhaps with critical legal studies. He started with Willard Hurst, who strongly asserted when functionalism of law was bound to be objectors, there's bound to be objectors somewhere. And he uses the example that a crescent wrench way may work as a hammer, but it's not very good. And he examples some of his own home repairs. So sometimes he thinks, or he says perhaps people in uh, critical legal studies are making conclusions where they don't necessarily fit because critical legal studies does have a sort of grand narrative as we'll see. So critical legal studies took place where objectors appear for example, Bob Gordon, Morty Horowitz, and Mark Tushner, Tushmet, um, are examples of critical legal studies historic, um, scholars. Willard Hurst was a strange target by these individuals, however, because he objected to the Vietnam War, the, tr the truncation of civil rights achievements, and the crippling of organized labor. So these are all things that critical legal studies scholars support. But they were partisan to the Brandeisian, but he was partisan to the Brandeisian progressive New Deal types as well. So he also advocated for sometimes things uh, trumping the uh, law, for example, policy, legislators, or science. Particularly in the Brandeis brief, it advocated that science should perhaps take a precedence over law in certain occasions. So that was not something that the critical legal studies scholars supported. However, they did, and as well, the New Deal they did not support, but they did support his stance on Vietnam and the civil rights movement. So, but nonetheless, Willard Hurst was the primary target of the critical legal studies historic, uh, scholars at the time, which prompted much of their work, even though he was not really their, um, their absolute enemy. Uh, but he, uh, he shared their abhor abhorrences he said, with them, so includes John Henry Schlegel, so John Henry Schlegel refers to we, he refers to himself as one of uh, a critical legal studies scholar, but they did, he did not share the faiths with William Hurst. 
sort of, he notes. Therefore, this fight over functionalism amounted to near nothing, but in Robert Unger's total critique in Webster's, he, he wards the examination of a thing or situation with a view of determining its natural limitations became a major approach to critical legal study scholars and historians. So despite this, the, their arguments once again against um, uh, functionalism, which was also something that prompted postmodernism was also in response to functionalism. But functionalism perhaps might be seen as a more uh, conservative belief, whereas postmodernism, as well as critical legal studies, are perhaps more uh, liberal or more left uh, left wing. But they're both, uh, yeah. But not to delve too much into that. Crit so critical legal studies claim in the academic world of North Atlantic, he says, ties the critique of activities of Kant's critique and on the left of the work of the Frankfurt schools. And ultimately, they claim that the li liberal realism um, the liberalism claim that while smile bits may need fixing fundamentally, it is fundamentally sound, and which is um, in contrast to the critical legal studies claim that the liberal democracy claim was not true according to. Um, so essentially the critical legal studies is while it is perhaps left uh, considered on the left wing of the spectrum, it is opposed to this idea of liberal legalism that advocates that while certain parts might be wrong, it is good on the whole. Critical legal studies thinks it is perhaps on the whole wrong. And that is a reason why perhaps uh, Christopher Tomlins might be fit more under the liberal legalism, whereas uh, uh, less so as an absolute critical legal studies individual as well. We could put Willard Hurst in that group as well, that being just a, a liberal, but not necessarily one, a critical legal studies scholar. In the 1980s, it was this critical legal studies became extremely effective because there was moral panic for many, and it caused moral panic for many liberal legalist scholars, particularly those with a conservative stripe, he notes. So, but what happened? Why did they cause to fade in the 1990s, particularly also critical legal studies as well, is that they were replaced by feminist jurisprudence and critical race theory. So. A lot of the proponents of critical legal studies side is sort of dispersed into feminist jurisprudence and critical race theory as alternatives or more specific fields. Almost no one remembered Art Leff, Richard Posner, and Robert Ogner at this time. The international human rights offered a pure, even primitive positivism, providing a sufficient grounding for legal action. So there was sort of these uh, practical uh, um, alternatives to critical legal studies so rather than just break everything down there was um, international human rights law so there was a practical approach but also there was sort of a diversification into different fields as well the grounding for the reason was difficult and across the board um, for example there was so there was difficulties also for marxism structuralist and deconstructuralist so as we just referenced structuralism also became uh, weakened during this time as well, because none put their and but he notes that none of these put their own arguments under pressure. They were really just pressuring each other. So the critical legal studies scholars were criticizing the structuralists, the Marxists were criticizing the deconstructuralists. And nonetheless, none were really taking a introspective um, outlook. Therefore, there needs to be a focus. The focus for the remainder of the chapter, he notes that it. Um, uh, how to he will criticize critical legal studies itself and it would make it easy he says to focus on other than the best works because it would be easy to criticize critical legal studies by working on looking at some of the less successful works but that would be something not of great integrity so instead he looks at the labor history of critical legal studies scholars because they are both the largest body and especially of high quality of critical legal studies work and he, they're also written by his friends, so he's also notes that he's not being, uh, he notes this uh, partiality and that he, he would have all the reason to support them and that he's trying to be as critical of critical legal studies as possible. So he starts with the work of Carl Clare's work about the Supreme Court in the late 1930s titled Judicial or uh, Deradicalization of the Wagner Act. 
and the origins of modern legal consciousness from 1937 to 1941 where they it, where the author emphasized the centrality of labor peace to preserve organizations and it was maybe only to to it could have been caused by strikes anyways and it was mainly or um, but so essentially the argument of this critical critical legal studies scholar said that the the it was in favor of the corporations but there were maybe um certain causes such as other causes such as both big and little corporations as well had a stake in as well as well as external forces such as the fascist influences and the war at the time he notes that real competition itself sucks and therefore there needed to be some sort of um, labor movements but there needed also to be some support for the corporations particularly at this time and he references in this uh, section a lot of uh, some of the economic hardships that were going on at the time and i was thinking of this one of the greatest finance books I've, I've ever got, uh, the S Security Analysis by uh, Benjamin Graham and David L. Dodd. I, it's kind of the, I think the, the, the textbook version of the, the longer version of The Intelligent Investor by the same authors, but nonetheless it goes through a lot of the financial crises and depressions that were going through during these times, and nonetheless it was not all just because of this perhaps to support the corporations or to support this uh, perhaps white anglo-saxon protestant elite but there were a lot of other elements going on here so nonetheless taking a critical approach of this critical legal studies work on labor he next new moves to a piece about a much earlier period by white holt's labor conspiracy cases in the united states from 1805 to 1842 in that uh, in that there bins and legislation in common law adjudication that examined all the reported cases where in the early 19th century journeymen were charged with common law criminal conspiracy for evidence of anti-union bias which is a very uh, critical legal studies work so the german the journeymen were forming unions as labor was being consolidated at the time and they felt they noted loss of independence and even loss of self-esteem. The report showed judges had a bias against the journeymen in rulings and the working, and and in terms of working conditions. That, but however, the competition was affecting employers too. So although there was a, uh, there was competition that affected that negatively affected the situation for many of the workers, this competition was also hurting many of the corporations as well. And it was better not to hide a union, which was ultimately John Henry Schlegel's final conclusion that although the, the jurists may appear to have been against the unions, perhaps they were more so, so against the hidden unions or the conspiracy type unions. And the judges acted on both groups almost equally, he notes. Perhaps um, the, the author of this, uh, White Holt, might disagree, but nonetheless, once again, John Henry Schlegel took a critical view of this critical legal studies work. Then moves to Dine, Diane Avery's dealt with the years between both Carl and Holt's works in her Images of Violence in Labor Jurisprudence, The Re Regulation of Picketing and Boycotts in 1894 to 1921, where they covered pickets and boycotts, were regulated to defend the owners of property, there were, um, it, but he notes that it was not necessarily management versus workers, particularly in the Gilded Age, where Andrew Carnegie was seen as a, actually an ab absolute exception in that he owned and managed Carnegie Steel, even one such as John D. Rockefeller, who owned uh, in, um, Standard Oil, I believe it is, or owned the largest oil company in the world at the time, did not actually have full management capacities. Even Henry Ford, he cites, until he bought Dodge Brothers in 1919, did not have full control over his company while having the equity. So just a small nuance like that. It's not necessarily managers against workers. It could be owners against managers against workers. There's multiple more elements than just a binary fight. And therefore, hurting owners could also hurt workers. And it also must be noted that for 
failure of a manager in some way was the same as a failure for workers because managers could suffer job loss or loss of wage as well so the managers did not have it all that great as well as particularly during these times once again referenced a lot in the Gilded Age perhaps in securities analysis Gilded Age and among others there were also as noted many financial recessions and most had little diversification and retirees so a lot of these shareholders it wasn't at the time at the time it was like now I just when I buy stocks I just have a my bank account and I just I can buy 40 different stocks at a time like different companies but then you had to get a broker most had were heavily had their wealth concentrated in a few companies so they had more perhaps at stake and therefore perhaps maybe more need to protect their business interests also the ownership of a lot of these businesses were family businesses with attachments and commitments to their employees and even often sometimes they kept the business going when suffering at losses he's not uh, arguing he notes for a moral equivalency of capital and labor but notes that they were both under siege in a dog-eat-dog -dog world so perhaps look a lot of legal critical legal studies scholars today look at these and think oh these capitalists were abusing the laborers but it must be seen the nuances at the time that there were difficulties perhaps for these some of these uh, owners so sort of as once again critical legal studies is often a left-wing belief but or left wing based on left wing foundings that a lot of these laws were created to support the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants or the capitalists for example but must be taken note of at the time and it must be a duty of someone a critical legal studies scholar to take a critical look at their own work he next moves to the development of the employment uh, will rule by J Feynman it covers the American alternation alteration of the old English law that made it so unless a hiring of an employee was specified for a specific term it was automatically defined for one year and therefore it was defined that these times could be possibly shorter because as there was a change from an agricultural to a mechanical economy the right after right after the great pandemic in 1893 also in the high gilded age once again and that it perhaps favored managers but he knows that managers are people too and they also had to protect their own jobs so once again there's nuance, nuances and it's almost ironic that if critical legal studies obviously they are critical in one sense but they must also be critical of their own work therefore critical legal studies critiques based on class ethnicity gender or sexuality can be uh, often sometimes more privileged as well sometimes they might overly privilege or underprivileged but he says this is not that th not the thing that critical legal studies Marxist structuralists cannot be said with a level of assurance or politics even in but in writing they one must choose winners look at also losers but also run-ups and he says to what degree of assurances can one make their conclusions and therefore he says who says without a privileged position which is the title of the chapter who said says s-e-z or s-e-z and therefore he says it's best when understanding events that do not square with one's own interests so he notes that it's often better for if someone is writing on a topic if they're not they don't necessarily have a stake in it otherwise it might become uh, it might have too much bias and there are always losers and the, that can strengthen the arguments and humanity by understanding them so looking at the losers there's a certain humility in it as well he does not mean to have an, a completely objective history and but he notes once again the, the poem by Auden it captures the desire to slip out of one's own position but he recognizes the impossibility except as a boast William James calls this blooming buzzing confusion so it's almost impossible to get the biases out but it's important to be critical even in critical legal studies historians he says live in a world that Peter Novaki is in called that noble dream trapped by past present race ethnicity gender sexual orientation education class position toilet training and other rebellions too so everyone has certain biases that cannot be avoided so even critical legal studies for all the benefits that it has posed in the world and all the success it has they must be critical of themselves too he says 
it's all prevent for an unconcerned or privileged position. So all can prevent for an unconcerned or unprivileged position, even though critical legal studies is focused on supporting the underprivileged, it might take a privileged position by naturally or inadvertently. He says, after reading an earlier version of this chapter, Barry Cushman asked the author, can your can you name a successful critical reform movement that devoted a lot of effort to analyzing critiquing its own animating foundational assumptions so can did any do this not just critical legal studies not doing it he in a similar style to the question he posed to christopher tomlins he also said no but he says as an utopian he always is tempting a less awful curriculum so he himself says he's actually perhaps practicing what he's preaching and taking a critical approach to his own work. And he says a not Maoist self criterion may clearly reflect the work of influences and that of those he knows and loves. So by taking a critical approach, even a critical of those he of his friends and those he loves, he knows he can still manifest their ideas by being critical. And he advocates for the possibility of more than a statutory 15 minutes of Warholian fame. He says, if you do, he closes with, if you disagree, stop by for a thumb wrestling. So I think that's nice that he you know, opens up to the challenge as well. But also, I think it's also ironic that he says a statutory 15 minutes of Warholian fame because Warholian Warhol, Andy Warhol, endeavored to make really modern art, but ironically, it's been timeless. So, and I think that's, I think, something that John Henry Schlegel might advocate for, too, by being critical. It, and it might eventually be replaced as well. It might still be, have a lasting influence beyond this 15 minutes of Warholian fame. And I also, he, this last thing, where if you disagree, stop by at thumb wrestling. I'd also add, perhaps push back and say, if you do agree, perhaps still stop by for a thumb wrestling. I might add that to if I were had the opportunity to speak with this great scholar, John Henry Schlegel. So we will talk a little bit more about him in the comparison, but first to look at the slide we have here. So his institution, the University of Buffalo School of Law, his positions distinguished professor, and Floyd H. and Hilda L. Hurst faculty scholar. Suggested readings include While Waiting for Rain, Community, Economy, and Law in a Time of Change, published by the University of Michigan Press in 2022, as well, next book, American Legal Realism and Empirical Social Science, published by the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill Press in 1995. His research focuses include American Legal Realism, Legal History of the American Economy, Corporate Finance, Economic Redevelopment of the Rust Belt Cities. In terms of the images we have here in the uh, bottom right, Northwestern University, where he received his Bachelor of Arts. The left, we have the University of Chicago, where he received his Juris Doctor. The top right, we have the University of Stanford University School of Law, where he taught as a uh, had a teaching position for a time, and the University of Buffalo School of Law, where he is currently a professor and faculty scholar. As per the quotes, we have. First, in the academic world of the North Atlantic, the invocation of critique ties any activity to Kant's critiques, and on the left, the work of the Frankfurt School, but more importantly, to the idea of reasons as a standing aside from the object of critique, a standing in a privileged place, dist distance from the object, setting it apart so as to permit seeing the object in its true nature. Next quote. For critical legal studies scholars, the claim of liberal legalism that while small bits of law might need fixing, the great structure was fundamentally sound, was shot through with unexamined preferences for some citizens and not others, in particular preferences that established the otherness of these persons, non-whites, women, and laborers. These, I think, two very... Uh, difficult quotes to parse out that's why I also put them up here so you can take some time to read them back if, if you have the visual as well here but nonetheless I think they have a lot of ideas in these two quotes moving to the next and then the last as a utopian I believe that when not in a Maoist mode self-criticism would more fully reflect the position that scholars especially the historians whose work I know and love are in when and whatever they write so 
I really, once again, this is chapter 30, titled Says Who? Critical Legal History Without a Privileged Position by John Henry Schlegel in part three of the Oxford Handbook of Legal History, Perspectives, Legal History and Modern Legal Thought. So once again, I thank John Henry Schlegel for, what, for firstly, for helping me better understand what critical legal studies is as a whole and also how one might better approach it and other forms of scholarship. So without further ado, we will move to the comparison with Justin de Sotel Stein. So the comparison between Justin de Sotel Stein and John Henry Schlegel. So similarity, unlike some of the previous comparisons we've had, are they are both med American educated and American professors. So sometimes we have some from the UK, or sometimes um, lots from Israel, sometimes from Australia, sometimes from Canada, across the world, and I think we'll start to see more um, in the East as well as we proceed through the textbook. But these both come from similar backgrounds and similar present um, institutions. It must be noted that one is currently in Buffalo and one is in Colorado, which do have different cultures, of course, but they, um, nonetheless, they're more similar than some that we've compared previously. But if we could, we could probably have a whole, uh, whole discussion on the nuances between the different educational paths. In terms of their focus, one chapter covered postmodernism, structuralism, and poststructuralism, where the others studied on critical legal studies. While they're uh, they're both, I think, similar in that they're both considered to the left wing. Um, the, and they, the structure of their chapters were really quite different, whereas Justin de Sotel Stein sort of did a, um, a progression from postmodernism to poststructuralism to structuralism, ultimately likely advocating for the third, whereas the latter, John Henry Schlegel, focused mo primarily almost all on critical legal studies with the discussions about other chapters, uh, other um, other forms of study as well, but really taking a critical approach of one and not necessarily uh, advocating one over another, but really criticizing or uh, being critical of one approach. But nonetheless, his, I think, was structured in focusing on specific examples that manifested some of the shortcomings, whereas the, the chapter by J Justin de Sotel Stein is a more kind of... Uh, uh, more of a linear path, I would suppose. So in terms of, and once again, both of these areas, postmodernism, critical legal studies, uh, structuralism, poststructuralism, are associated with the left. However, both incorporated um, sort of right-wing ideas into it, so to kind of uh, add a little bit of balance as well. They both have two books. Um, Justin de Sotel Stein has another in the process, but John Henry Schlegel perhaps may have more in the process too. They and they both have many, many articles that they've written. They both have references to Christopher Tomlins, in that Justin de Sotel Stein co edited a book with Christopher Tomlins, whereas John Henry Schlegel references a discussion he had with Christopher Tomlins in his chapter. But both of them are also included in the Oxford Handbook of Legal History, which we are covering, in which Christopher Tomlins is one of the editors, along with Marcus D. Dubber. So they both, um, I think, Marcus D. Dubber and Christopher Tomlins are definitely, amongst many others, uh, two leaders in the legal history field. And it's nice to see how they, at least they connect through these individuals. I don't necessarily know if Justin de Sotel Stein and John Henry Chico both know each other, but they both know or are in connection with Christopher Tomlins and likely Marcus D. Dubber as well. And they're both a commonality where they might differ from most or many other lawyers is that they are both historians. They both do have an interest in international economic development. However, Justin de Sotel Stein's work focuses a bit more on international law, whereas John Henry Shigel seems to be focusing more on the Rust Belt. They both have a focus on United States and common law focus, both being American educated and American professors. The in terms of uh, degrees, uh, the, Justin de Sotel Stein has notes in this page. He has three graduate degrees. Um, John Henry Schell has a uh, law degree and a undergraduate degree, but both of them I could not see. Neither of them, I believe, have PhDs. 
one might say the Juris Doctor, some do say it is a doctorate degree, but it is not the traditional PhD that many other scholars in the Oxford Handbook of Legal History did or do have. So, um, but, um, and they both also have significant practice as attorneys as well. So, in a, whereas many other scholars, um, not necessarily in this Oxford Handbook of Legal History, went straight into their academic career after, they both had significant work as uh, practicing in law as well. So thank you so much for watching this video on Guide to Legal History and Historians. I hope you enjoyed. My name is Kaylin Ashcroft. This is Cashcroft TV, and I hope you continue to support. Thank you so much.